Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Anderson, President and CEO of the Oklahoma City Museum of Art, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's opening of Art and Activism at Tougaloo College. Uh, before we begin tonight, I'm going to be introducing the, um, or welcoming um, a representative, a curator from the American Federation of the Arts, Ilaria Conti, who will say a few things uh, about this exhibition and about this uh, uh, partnership, and I would just add, and I know many of you have heard of AFA before, but we've been working with them now for many, many years before we were actually even an accredited, uh, before we were an official institution. So we're very pleased to continue that partnership with this wonderful exhibition. So, Ilaria. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ilaria Conti. I'm a curator at the American Federation of Arts, and I'm really delighted to join you here today at the Oklahoma City Museum of Art um, for the preview of this beautiful exhibition, Art and Activism at Tougaloo College, which, as you've heard, is an exhibition organized by the AFA and Tougaloo College with guest curator Terry Flucker. Um, at the AFA, we've had the honor of developing exhibitions for nearly, sorry, for nearly 115 years. We were founded in 1909 and have worked for more than a century really to bring exceptional, exceptional curatorial and uh, artistic projects to a broad spectrum of institutions and publics across the United States. And today, um, over 3,500 exhibitions later, it is still a huge pleasure to share one-of-a-kind U.S. collections with institutions such as the Oklahoma City um, Museum of Art and, such, and with patrons like yourselves. Um, I would say that, as we all know, the U.S. Um, as a country is um, host to a very, very rich um, artistic heritage that is born from collective struggles and achievements. And this exhibition in particular exemplifies such richness by highlighting the unique history of the first collection of modern art in Mississippi, as you will hear, established um, in 1963 at Tougaloo College, an historically African-American institution located north of Jackson. And as Terry will elaborate, this is a collection that really became a vital fortress for art and civil rights at a crucial time in the history of the country. And it did so really through um, the excellence of the artists collected, uh, which include major figures. You will have the chance to see their works tonight, um, spanning from Henry Matisse and Pablo Picasso all the way to Romero Bearden, Elizabeth Catlett, and many, many others. So um, we always like to remember that the founders of this collection wished uh, for it to be um, um, what they defined an interracial oasis um, in which the fine arts are the focus and the magnet. And it is wonderful to know that 60 years after the collection's creation, um, the heritage of that oasis is presented here today with its magnetism and relevance um, pretty much still intact. So I would like to thank um, those who made this exhibition possible. First and foremost, uh, Tori Flucker, who's, as I said, the guest curator of this wonderful exhibition, but also a passionate Tougaloo alum, and uh, who currently serves as Vice President of Collections and Partnerships at the Terra Foundation um, for American Art. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the staff here at the museum, Michael Anderson, uh, Rosie May, um, and all the staff that really made this presentation here possible. I would also like to thank our colleagues at the AFA, Orion Newman, the Director of Exhibitions and Programs, and everybody else who's been working over the last few years to make this national um, tour possible. So um, I, in, in the end, I also would like to thank the funders and supporters who really made this exhibition possible. Um, the Robert Lehman Foundation, the Heron Luce Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, and the Terra Foundation for American Art, as well as the supporters who um, brought to life the catalog of the exhibition. I hope you will have the chance to uh, see it and to take it with you home. Um, the past Christian, um, past Christian books, Elizabeth Buffy Easton, Sarah Ben Aiden, Julie McGee, and Toria Marcus Phillips. Um, I also want to invite all of you to follow the activities of the American Federation of Arts through our website um, to learn about um, our organization, its very rich history, and the roster of exhibitions that we're working on and presenting all over the country. 
Um, and with this, I don't want to take much more of your time. So thank you. Enjoy this beautiful evening and the conversation. Thank you very much, Laria. And now to the, our introduction of tonight's speaker, uh, Turi M. Fluker. Uh, Turi has served as Vice President of Collections and Partnerships for the Terra Foundation of American Art since August 2022, where he oversees the Foundation's American Art Collection as well as fosters collaborative partnerships throughout the field. Previously Director and Curator of uh, Tougaloo College Art Collections in Tougaloo, Mississippi, hence the uh, relationship with this exhibition. Uh, Fluker provided the artistic vision guiding the stewardship of the college's art collections and cultivated a range of national partnerships. He curated and authored the traveling exhibition and catalog for art and activism at Tougaloo College, which was co-organized by AFA, and he organized the teaching exhibition, Freedom, Abstract Expressionism, Tougaloo College and the Civil Rights Movement. Please join me in welcoming Tori Fluker. And Rosie May, who will be on the, Dr. Rosie May, who will be on the uh, uh, stage tonight with Tori. All right. First order of business is make sure you all can hear us. Okay. Great. I'm, I'm gonna say something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Great. Um, first of all, I want to welcome you to the Oklahoma City Museum of Art, Tori, and thank you so much for. Um, uh, allowing us to host this stunning exhibition of modern art, which also has, as you'll learn over the next 45 minutes, a really compelling origin story. So I wanna dig in a bit um, by starting with this slide and asking you a bit of background on Tougaloo College. Yes, well, thank you all so much for having me. Um, Tougaloo College was founded in 1869 um, at Tougaloo, Mississippi, which was a village, or is a village, I should say, uh, right outside of Jackson, Mississippi, which is the capital of the state. Um, it was founded by an organization called the American Missionary Association. And the American Missionary Association was a an organization that came out of the Amistad court case. Um, and the Amistad uh, committee that worked with the Amistad incident, which was the Africans that were kidnapped from, from Sierra Leone and um, committed mutiny aboard a slave ship called Amistad. And that Amistad ship uh, was directed to the northeast um, they were intending for the ship to go back to Africa. It went to the Northeast. They were held captives. And there was a committee in New Haven, Connecticut, that um, formed themselves. And um, they elicit, elicited the help of John Quincy Adams. Uh, the case went to the Supreme Court. The judge, uh, Judge Story, uh, said that, they, that these captives um, need to return to Africa. And, um, and so they did. Uh, Joseph Sinkay was the leader of the Africans uh, aboard that ship. And his vow was to, um, to go back to Africa to deal with the issue of slavery, which was a big world global issue. Um, and um, he wanted the committee to work with him to accomplish those goals. Um, the committee, the Amistad committee said, you know, we, we have some things to do in the U.S. And so they um, decided to found the American Missionary Association in Albany, New York um, on uh, September 3rd, 1846. And that um, missionary association founded uh, six other institutions throughout the American South after the Civil War. Um, and so it was the, the, their intent was to eradicate slavery and to eradicate caste, uh, a system of caste. And they used these schools um, as, uh, as what I call race laboratories um, to 
assist in that really bold mission um, after the Civil War. They said of themselves that they brought light and love after the bullets and guns of the Civil War were gone. Um, and so that's Tougaloo. Tougaloo was um, an agent from the AMA that came down from Albany and scouted for a school, um, to, uh, scouted for land, I should say, to open a school. They um, bought for $10,500 at the time. This was in 1860, um, 1868, 1867, between 1867 and 1868. Um, 10, 000, um, for $10,500, they, they bought 500 acres of land and this house. And, um, and this was um, a house that was on the Bodie Plantation. So this was a working cotton plantation with a house that was built by John Bodie, was actually built by enslaved people. John Bodie um, oversaw the building of it. He built it for his fiancee at the time. Um, and she requested that a cupola would be put at the top of the house so that she could see the city of Jackson since they were in the rural community. Um, unfortunately, she left him for another love. And the house um, just uh, sort of was, was there. Um, he stored a lot of his um, farm equipment in the house. It was really a, a house that was left undone um, um, after it was built because he was just going to go in once they moved in and just sort of work it, work through it. Um, and, um, and so, um, he never got a chance to do that. I think he wanted to just be a romantic and, and really be in the house and, and finish the house um, uh, with uh, him and his, um, and his fiance, but she had other plans. Um, and so, um, so the house um, was, was, was there, working cotton plantation, the AMA come, and they, um, they broker a deal, and they purchased the, the land and the house, and the house became the first a permanent structure on the campus for their school. Um, and their school was to be an integrated school. Uh, always the intent of the AMA was to um, have integrated spaces, um, spaces where um, both blacks and whites could be um, working together. Most of the teachers that came for the school were from New England. Um, they all lived on the campus. Most of them, this, um, they, they lived in this house before they really began build out the campus and, um, and had held classes in this, um, in this building. So this is, this is really sacred ground for us um, at the college. Um, it's, it sits on the highest part of the, of the, um, of the, of the plantation at the time of the land, um, now the school. And, um, and it really is one of these really grand um, um, 1848 um, mansions. It's just exquisite um, architecture. And our, um, our president is, um, works, is working towards um, more restoration on the inside. Restoration has um, taken place on I'm the getting, outside. I'm getting indications that um, have put to, the have microphone closer. Oh, no, closer. it's put the microphone closer. 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 I'm sorry. I hope you all didn't miss that fascinating story. So yes. I am going to ask you, um, so this is uh, affectionately known as the mansion. Yes. Um, but, and the real, but the real title is the, um, of it is the Robert O. Wilder Administration Building. So it was, um, when I was a student there, it was our um, administration building. Our president lived in the house. Um, they had offices in the house and sort of was the business office uh, central uh, for, to, for everything, um, which is kind of appropriate. Okay. Um, so... I'm torn about my next question, but I'm going to ask you, tell us the story the exhibition is telling. Yeah, so for me, what I wanted to do with this exhibition is to um, tell a story about Tougaloo, um, the place, um, but more importantly, I think, tell a story about um, the New Yorkers who really were the so the catalyst for, um, for forming this collection. So for me, it was 
it was really this idea of uh, really sitting down during the pandemic, frankly, and thinking that more people should know about this story. They should know about Tougaloo, and more people should know about the story of, um, of the New York Art Committee that founded the collection in 1963. And, and, and also understand what was happening um, in Mississippi at that time, and what was happening in our country at that time, frankly. Um, so that was sort of the impetus for the, the exhibition. That's really one of the major goals that I had was to really get the story out to tell the story of this art collection, but more importantly, to tell the story of what was happening in, in our country in 1963. Um, and so that really kind of led me to thinking more about how to, um, how to organize the show to, and this idea of being, being, being in partnership with AFA to travel the show. Um, AFA had been partners with Tougaloo since, since the, the founding of the collection in 63. So I just always felt that it was a natural, um, sort of, it was, a, it was natural for us to sort of become partners again. Um, it, it just made sense for us um, because of AFA's rich touring history. And, um, and also wanting to go back to what was happening at that time. That was important for me. To so, in fact, go I'm going to jump forward to this slide. And um, I, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what was happening in, in Tougaloo in the 60s. Yes. Yeah, so, um, this is really at the, one of the most important images. Um, that we, that we have that really tells the story about um, of what, what was happening in 1963 in Mississippi. So, and what was happening at, happening at Tougaloo. So in 1962, uh, Medgar Evers, who was a civil rights activist in Mississippi, was um, interested in, um, in a, in a lunch counter sit-in demonstration. And, um, and so he had been having meetings at Tougaloo. He was meeting at, um, in our chapel, which is on the campus of the college, which actually faces the mansion, the building that you just saw. Um, and that was um, a meeting house. It had always been a meeting house, uh, integrated space. Um, and so they were meeting um, the local in double, uh, and by the way, let me, who Medgar Evers was. He was the field secretary for the, uh, for the National South, uh, excuse me, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, um, the NAACP. And the, the local office um, was in, were working together with um, the Tougaloo's chapter. And they wanted to, um, to, do, to stage a lunch counter sit-in. John Salter, who is our, one of our, was one of our sociology professors, and John headed up that, that um, the Tougaloo chapter of the NAACP. So he brought together Joan Trumpire, who was in the middle there, and Ann Moody, and a few other students, Memphis Norman, uh, Memphis Norman and Perlina Lewis. Um, and they were all sort of gathering in um, Ed King's house. Ed King was our chaplain at the time, so he hosted them in the chapel and um, with Medgar, and they decided that they would stage this, um, this really, um, this, this, it, it was a, a real force um, because Jackson had not, um, they just were not integrating their businesses downtown. And Medgar had been protesting and petitioning for that to happen um, and, um, and staging demonstrations, but it, it, it really wasn't working. So they wanted something sort of um, uh, powerful, um, and they felt that the lunch counter sit-ins had been successful 
um, throughout the South, and the first one was in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina in 1960. Um, so three years later, they decide that they, they want to, um, to do this. So when it happened, they staged it where the black students, and, and again, Tougaloo, again, was always sort of this integrated community, integrated space. So, the, so they staged it to have the black students, and Memphis Norman um, and um, Perlina Lewis are not in this photograph, but Anne is. So Memphis and Anne and Perlina sat at the lunch counter. And, um, and so there was this, you know, just normal um, jeering of students that had been, had come from their lunch break at Central High School, which is not far from where this lunch counter, uh, Woolworth um, building is or was. And, and so, so they sit and, um, and they just sort of heckle them while they're sitting. But then it really started to turn violent when John sits down, John Salter, who is our professor, sociology professor, and then Joan sits, sits down. And Joan was a student at Tougaloo. And, and that's when all of the um, condiments start to just sort of um, be poured on, on their heads. And, um, and I, was, I was saying um, to Rosie early on that um, I did an interview with John um, years later when I was in graduate school about this incident and what had happened and what, was, was, uh, what his thoughts were, you know, in, um, in retrospect. And he, um, he showed me the cigarette burns um, that were still present on his neck, that they put, cigar they put their cigarettes out on, his, on the back of his neck. They poured mustard and uh, ketchup, uh, sugar, and um, they pulled... Memphis off of the stool because he was still sitting at the far end, not in this particular shot, but he was sitting in the far end and he pulled him down off the stool and kicked him so severely that he had to be taken to the, to the emergency room um, in, that, in that moment. Um, the, um, Perlina is, um, there, was, there were reporters that were, that were there reporting the incident. Perlina was talking to a reporter. She was badly beaten. Um, during this time, um, and they just continue to just pour condiments on John and Joan and Ann. And Ann Moody writes about this incident in her book, uh, Coming of Age in Mississippi, which I highly recommend. It's, um, mine is torn and, 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 and tattered. I've read it so many times. Um, what, what happens really quickly, Rosie, is what happens at the end is that um, our president, um, Dr. Beidel, um, comes and he is trying to get um, the store to close. Um, and so he calls the New York office to get them to close the store. And, um, and so there's another shot um, that Fred Blackwell, who took this photograph, um, has of our president um, um, at the end of the bar, really trying to get them to to, to shut the store down because the violence had just escalated so, so, so badly. Um, and um, Ed King is, um, our, again, our, one of our, uh, well, our chaplain at the time. He is on the phone with Medgar, and so he's giving Medgar a blow, blow by blow of what was happening at the time. Medgar kept saying, I should come, I should come. And he said, no, if you come, they will, they will kill you. This, this is, I mean, it had gotten just that violent um, in the store. So finally, um, the store was, the, the New York office um, asked for the local manager to close the store, and that's how things started to kind of um, dissipate. Um, and, and so it was, it was just really one of these pivotal scenes of, um, or moments, I should say, of, of what was happening at Tougaloo at the time in which the art collection comes to Tougaloo. So it comes in this very um, volatile uh, time in which our students and faculty were really at the height of, um, of, of really social change in Mississippi. And, and, um, and I will say that Dr. Beidle, our president at the time, he allowed students to, be, to participate in these activities as long as they um, kept their grades up and that they didn't miss class. And so oftentimes during protests, 
you will see students, and this, this happened, but um, two, is that you'll see them with their books or their reading, um, wherever they're, they're going um, in, in, in protest. And this, this was no different. It's just that by the time uh, Fred took this photograph, the books had been you know, uh, sort of removed from the, um, from the, uh, from the counter. So into this activism that was encouraged um, by the college, um, participated in by the professors, by the chaplain, comes... Comes, comes Dory, yes. <laughs> so tell us about Dory Ashton and the New York Committee. So, um, so in 1962, Dory's brother, Stephen Ashton had been at the campus. He was an exchange student from Oberlin. And he had never been to the American South before. And he, you know, was really, you know, taken aback by protests, what was happening, what was being discussed on the campus. He um, wanders into a, a, a drawing class um, that was uh, taught by Ronald Schnell. And Ron Schnell came to Tougaloo in, um, in 1959 to teach German, but he really wanted to teach art. And Tougaloo had, didn't have a formal art department at the time. And so the administration allowed him to teach drawing, these elective drawing classes. So Stephen wanders into the, into the um, drawing room, and he just strikes up a conversation with Ron. And Ron says, you know, um, yes, this is tough times, um, and um, but you know we can just, you know, come together, you know, draw, paint, and and that's really what Schnell was doing. He was really he was painting, he was um, um, involved, but but again was um, really felt that that if students had um, a, a different outlet to think about kind of move through to sort of express themselves um, through a creative process that they could sort of get through what was happening. Because it really was, you know, this, it was a volatile, um, volatile time in Mississippi. Um, so Stephen asked Ron Schnell, he said, you know, well, what can I do, what could I do for, for Tougaloo? You know, and he said, well, you know, we, we are in desperate need of art supplies, so I want to keep this going, you know, keep this um, art program going. And um, so he goes back to Oberlin, and he calls Dory, his sister. And Dory Ashton was an art critic, and she um, wrote for the New York Times and had been working a lot with all of the New York school uh, painters and um, working a lot with with. Rothko and Pollock and de Kooning and, um, and really beginning to think about how art was going to be remembered. What, 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 what will America contribute? Um, and, and, and so they were having these really, you know, sort of philosophical conversations. She was what I call the den mother of that, of that movement. And when when Stephen goes back and asks her, you know, uh, says to her, listen, you know, you should know about Tougaloo, you should know about um, what was happening in Mississippi, um, she says to him, well, I'm already doing some work in New York, and she was raising money, helping to raise money for CORE, which is the Congress of Racial Equality. Uh, she was staging these exhibitions called Artists for CORE exhibitions, and the Artists for CORE exhibitions would allow for um, her to, um, to work with artists, have the, have the exhibitions, um, whatever they sell from the exhibitions, then the money would go to CORE. She worked a lot with James Farmer, and she also worked with, um, she, she worked to raise money for Dr. King's travel expenses as well. So she was working with CORE and uh, uh, Dr. King and SNCC. And, and so that's what she tells Stephen. And so when, um, so, so she says to Stephen, listen, I'm, I'm just going to call Tougaloo directly. I don't want to, 
you know, have you in the middle of this. And so she writes Schnell, and Schnell tells her that, you know, we, we would love whatever help that you can give us. If you want to you know, give us art supplies, we will take it. That's really what we want, but we'll, we'll take whatever you, you give us. And, um, and before he knew it, and this was 63, before he knew it, Dory had arranged for, um, uh, for art to be sent to the college. Um, she had worked with the committee, um, and although she never really liked committees, uh, that wasn't her thing, um, but a committee sort of formed with Jean Renal and Tommy Seals and Fritz Boltman, um, and uh, Peter Seltz were um, sort of her pals. And so she gathered them and said, listen, this is, this is something that I think we can sink our teeth into and really be a part of and, and give original art to Tuglu. And so she did. And, and Schnell had no idea that the art was coming. So there were these crates coming to the campus. There was no room to store them. There was no space for them. And, um, and so they came, and then she wrote a formal letter to our president, Dr. Beidel, and, 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 and the rest is history, really, is how the committee was formed. And interestingly enough, in 64, which was Freedom Summer, students, um, Schnell said, well, you know, we, we want to thank you. We want, you know, and we want students to be a part of this, this this process, and so he gathered students um, to go to New York to visit Dory, and so she welcomes them. Fritz Boltman welcomes them. Um, they uh, come, go to New York, and they are really the, they roll out the red carpet for them. So they go to a show in Carnegie Hall. They go to all of the major museums, the Whitney, MoMA. Um, they go to the New York Times office where Dory was working. And, um, and so they also bring back art, um, more art that the um, benefactors, or this art committee members, I should say, um, that they um, had for them. So we were able to get um, uh, the uh, Francis Bacabia, which, is, um, which was a part of the show, but unfortunately, I don't think you guys um, it wasn't able to travel, but the Pacabia came during that time. Uh, Joan Miro came. Um, we got an Arshel Gorky. Um, so we were able to get that, and they, they, they crammed it in Schnell's station wagon. Um, and they drive from New York back to Mississippi and, of course, drove up um, to New York at the time. And this was during their spring break, and they just had the, the, the best time. So the first section of the exhibition is that the first crate load, so to speak, that can I just, I'm just going to jump ahead and show. So there's a Picasso in that crate. Yes. A Matisse. Yes. And a George Gross. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, um, and so those, those works come to Tougaloo at the, at the very beginning. And, um, the, uh, the Picasso print um, was a gift from Fritz Boltman, and um, and so and Fritz and his wife really remain a big supporters of Tougaloo and this collection uh, up, up until their their deaths. So um, this is going off our little script, but um, what? So the New York Committee is sending artworks, they get this crate, and then the students go to New York, they come back with a station wagon full of art. And what happens next? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, what, <laughs> they, they just weren't expecting, the college wasn't expecting um, these kinds of objects to be, um, to be there. They, um, they, create a space in Warren Hall, which is a building that um, served as a, served as sort of a um, student union type of, um, type of building um, at the time. And so they form a, um, a gallery in the student union. And so the gallery is, is, is there um, for them to, um, to uh, view art. Uh, the students help to 
organize a show. They're very proud of the art, of the collection, of the exhibition um, that they produce. And they work, of course, with Schnell to do that. Um, and, and they write a catalog for it. Um, and I outline it in my essay in the exhi uh, exhibition catalog for this show um, that they say that, you know, we, this is our collection and, um, and how proud we are to have a collection like this on the campus. And, um, and, it's, and it's inspired by Dory, Dory's idea that we create a space for all to view art. And the interesting thing, too, is that they really embrace this idea of, of a space, an integrated space for all to, to view art, an oasis, if you will, um, because this was the first collection of modern art in the state. So if you wanted to see modern art, if you wanted to see art that was being um, created, uh, contemporary art, you really had to come to Tuvalu to see it. And so the students really got behind that idea. Um, and so that meant you had to um, move past the social mores that was, that was present in Mississippi at the time. You had to be in integrated spaces. You had to, um, to you know, bump shoulders with, um, with people from different backgrounds. And that just didn't happen in Mississippi in 1963. Um, and, you know, the thing that we take for granted of going to coffee with, um, with someone who is a different race just was not part of what was happening. And you certainly were not in integrated spaces where people were equal. Um, and um, so that was also a big, um, a big, a big thing of Dory's and what she, she and the other committee members really wanted to to be able to, um, to use this collection to, um, to do. So it's, um, I always tell people that the objects are great and I love them, they all are my children and so I can't wait to see them in the galleries here in Oklahoma. Um, but, um, but it really was about bringing people together and having different perspectives in the same room, viewing art and that the art again is the magnet. So then, um, so this is these early images that we're looking at, um, white European men, but then there was a shift in what was collected. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, um, and that was really a major, um, major part of the, of the growth of the collection. I think what was happening, um, Dory had an idea of, the Richard Mayhew. The Richard Mayhew comes um, in 60, uh, 64, and she uh, works. And this is part of a um, of the core artist of core uh, exhibition. So she arranged for it to come to Tougaloo, which was one of the first uh, works by an African American artist. Um, in the collection, um, and Hill Woodruff, I will say, um, also contributed to, um, to Tougaloo's collection um, in the 40s. But I think the major shift was um, after the committee disbanded in 1967, the idea was for, for stu the, the idea for, for the students was that we embrace this collection, we love this collection, we know that this is where we want it to be and we still fully, um, uh, we, we fully wrap our arms around um, the idea of it. But we w want to see works by, uh, by African American artists. And keep in mind, this is 60, 67, 68, um, our country is really shifting. Um, uh, the Vietnam War, um, the, the National Endowment for the Arts was created in 65, um, or the, the Humanities Act, the Arts and Humanities Act of 1965 was created to that, created the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And during this time, Schnell wanted, was, was listening to what the students wanted but they needed to find um, a funding. And so, um, so Schnell was, um, 
looking, uh, working with, looking for funding, working with our development office, which is our office was in New York at the time. So our development team, they were stationed in New York. And so they began to put their heads together to find ways to, to get funding so that they could purchase work. And so Schnell sees a, a, a television commercial of, of Nancy Hanks at the National Endowment for the Arts, who's the chairman who would she like to be called chairman? She wanted to, that was what was her preferred um, title. Um, and so she was, she was engaged in a new initiative that would allow for um, the purchase of works by living artists, living American artists. And so Schnell said, bingo, this is it. This is, you know, the, uh, the vehicle for me to, um, to purchase works by living artists. And so he begins to write this proposal that says that we want to purchase works by living artists, but we want to purchase works by black American artists. And um, our school, our students are interested in, this, in these artists, and he, of, of course, is interested in growing the art department. Um, and by this time, there is, he was able to to um, to petition and um, successfully petition um, the uh, administration to create an art a formal art department. So the art department was created in sixty seven as well. So the committee disbanded in sixty seven. The art department was created. He begins this this um, uh, campaign writing and proposal writing. Um, so the grant was successful for the NEA, and they were able to purchase. Um, the Romare Bearden, the textile collage that's in the, um, in the show. And this was our very first purchase um, with those NEA funds. And um, the story is so fantastic. Um, so Schnell and our development director in New York, they go to Romare Bearden studio on Canal Street in New York. And, um, and so they were shopping around and saw this textile. Um, but Schnell said he had uh, his idea, he had an idea about another piece that was in the, um, in the, in the studio. And um, Edel Feischer, who was the um, development director, she said, I think we should, we should look at this one. And so she turns um, Schnell's attention to this piece and um, and the uh, she she turns this direction to this piece, and Romare says, um, "Well, I'm just finishing it. It's not really complete, but it was just, you know, for for Edith. She she was just she was it was she was blown over by it. Um, and it's it's a, a large uh, piece that I'm sure you've all seen." But it was his first time really working in this, this um, textile. Um, he had done some collage textiles before, um, but, um, but not at this scale. And so he, um, he was a little hesitant about, um, about them um, eyeing this particular piece, but they were able to convince him. And so they purchased this work. Um, um, and it, again, one of the first pieces to come into the collection um, with funding from the NEA. So I always say this piece, and um, there's the sun and candle that's also in the... Um, Who's that by? Uh, Romare Bearden. Oh, yes, yes, the other Bearden. Yeah, the other Bearden that's in the show. So those, those, those two Beardens are the Beardens that were purchased at that time. Um, by um, with NEA funding, and I and I, I always say that. So these pieces, of course, belong to to Tugalu, but they belong to the people because they were purchased with funding from federal federal funding. Um, so, so that's. Um, so, I'll just. Yeah, this is a stunning piece by Alma Thomas, which we were able to purchase with uh, NEA funding. So it also is um, belongs to to Tugalu and the people. <laughs> and uh, David Driscoll. So David, um, so I'll go back to Ro Romy first um, and then segue into David. So 
Rome, Romare Bearden ended up becoming um, sort of almost like an unofficial purchasing agent for us. So when we purchased those works um, by him with um, NEA's funding, um, we were uh, we were looking at him to to lead, you know, tell us, you know, who else should we be buying and what should we be doing and how can we you know, be in partnership with you. So he, we, he began to really be in, in partnership with Tougaloo and with Schnell and our office in New York for many years after those, those initial purchases. Um, and so he led us to different, um, different people um, and opened different relationships. But um, with David, it became much more of a, a formalized relationship between Tougaloo and David and his consultation of who we should be looking after um, and looking out for in terms of what we want to purchase and to expand the collection beyond the European um, works that were in the collection. So David Driscoll was essential in that journey for us. And there are just, you know, lovely um, letters between David and Schnell that were written that went back and forth about um, just um, you know, about different um, different artists that were working and times in which Schnell was inviting David to the campus to do these talks, and um, it just I, I just love letters, and so to read these letters to that started the relationship between um, which is actually started by Edith um, at the in the office. Um, New York office. So she um, opened the conversation with David and then they carried on the relationship from then, from there on. Um, and they maintained a, a really solid relationship until both of them, um, until Schnell retired and, um, and just didn't, what, didn't have the ability to write anymore. Um, and then when, when I met David, and was able to really um, talk to him about the relationship. It was so endearing that um, that he, you know, he said that he was such a great friend of his, and and every time he would come to Mississippi, Schnell and his wife would cook them a, they, and they would be on the campus, um, cook them a great German dinner, and um, and so um, so it was, yeah, just a lovely um, friendship. Can I ask you, I want to save time for questions, but can I ask you, um, what is the legacy of this collection? Yeah, you know, I think about that all the time. Um, I think one of, the, one of the, the objectives and goals for me um, um, was, again, to tell the story. But I think that the legacy is a, a bigger story, a bigger legacy in the fact that, you know, Tougaloo was a part of this, um, a part of this narrative that was helping to shape American art. Um, and, and I think putting that back into the narrative, expanding the narrative, nuancing the narrative um, of, of American art is, 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 Tougaloo's a part of that. Tougaloo's a part of that 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 sort of American art legacy. Um, it was Dory was a part of that that conversation. She was um, essential to that conversation, um, and she was also, you know, talking about Tougaloo. So with Bob Motherwell, who was at the NEA at the very beginning, um, his shaping of what art looked like, you know how we should collect as Americans, what we should buy, um, was all part of that. Um, that was, uh, Tougaloo was a part of that conversation. Tougaloo was in it. Um, Tougaloo was on their minds. Um, Fritz Boltman and um, Jeannie Boltman, who uh, were part of the initial um, uh, uh, committee, uh, the New York Art Committee that formed the, the collection, uh, his... Fritz Boltman's uh, daughter-in-law lives in New Orleans, which is where I lived for a long time. And um, I would go by her, um, her house in the French Quarter and, um, 
And she would say, that's the table that Bob Motherwell and uh, Fritz Boltman and Dory Ashton sat and talked about Tougaloo. Wow. You know, and so I think that um, this is a story that um, as we began to talk, talk about how we are expanding narratives of American art um, is, is, is sort of missing. You know, so this is the place. This is this is. I'm just trying to place this back into into the full narrative and 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 allow for us to um, to think about that expansively, um, and to also think about it as a civil rights story um, as well. So it was it, as much as it was a art historical story, it was also a very um, um, it was it was a it was a civil rights story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you really quickly. When you and I talked before, you explained to me that um, you went to Tougaloo and your grandmother went to Tougaloo, and so your family has a history with Tougaloo. And also, you recall um, seeing the collection as an undergrad. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so yes, I'm a graduate of the college and um, knew most of these people that I've talked about. Um, Schnell was a great mentor to me. Um, as, a, as a matter of fact, as a student, I remember him um, uh, coming to me and saying, you know, it's up to you to tell this story, you know? And no that was sort of, as an undergrad, I was a big, thing I was just like wait you know and so um, and so and 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 you know and introducing me to different people at the time and really um, opening my eyes he and other prof art professors at the college um, to something that frankly I just didn't understand I didn't understand um, you know Dory's relevance I didn't understand you know um, Fritz Boltman and who he was, um, so I didn't understand it at that at that moment. Um, but in retrospect, I get what they were what they were trying to teach me and how they were really trying to kind of mold and open me up to really think expansively, um, and and also just the college itself. Um, you know, there were certain parts of the college that, in terms of its history, that I didn't get either. Um, but I was, um, but I get it now. I get it now, and I think it's just it's just hitting me, you know, with um, like, you know, it's just kind of running over me, you know, this 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 um, the special nature of what was what was happening um, at Tougaloo, um, or what had happened in terms of its founding. Um, so yeah, it was it was great. My my grandmothers would you know talk about Tougaloo um, often, um, and I um, you know would spend my childhood on the campus there um, during the summers. Um, would go there, and they would reminisce about you know their time there, and. Um, and just loved it. You know, my grand, my maternal grandmother would say that um, Tougaloo was one of the places that she really understood the world um, because there were so many people from all over the world that were, you know, either on faculty, um, that were visiting the, the campus, and that, um, you know, she had, she had been in Mississippi, had grown up there, um, but she felt that she was... She, she was, you know, sort of this international, she was sort of in this international place, this global place. Um, and that was, that was great for a woman um, in the 1940s to experience um, just that kind of, you know, environment. Um, she, she would talk about the smell of when she would go into the, um, the faculty because again, they lived on the campus, so they would invite her to dinner um, uh, when she was a student, and um, she would talk about um, the smell of the books, and the and there were just so many books in their homes, and um, 
and just the smell of paper and um, and how um, and cigarettes and um, and coffee and you know sort of all of these um, these these things that she just felt so she said um, m maternal and fraternal they just said they just felt so grown up you know <laughs> when um, at the, during the time in which they were at Tougaloo so and my maternal grandmother played basketball so she was a basketball um, star. And um, and graduated cum laude uh, from the college, and so so yeah, so it was it was a great um, it was it was great to hear their stories and to really sit at their feet and to understand um, what it meant to them um, to be um, to be students, to be women, to be uh, women of color uh, in Mississippi. Um, at that time and to be educated in the way in which they were educated. Yeah, that's really profound. Um, in the last four minutes, I want to open it up to any questions anyone has for Turi. Yes. I'm going to just repeat that for the camera. Um, so you asked if the people of Mississippi have um, an awareness and appreciation of the school and the collection. I, th I think so. I mean, I, I think more so for the school, um, less about the collection itself, um, just because I think that it's just so... Um, um, it's, just, it's just not understood as fully. Um, they, yes, I think, I think so. I think that that it's, you know, it's, it's sort of one of those collections that you, if you, you wouldn't, people of a certain age wouldn't have seen a collection like that at, um, at the, at the local museum. Um, so I think they just didn't, people just generally didn't have an appreciation for it and, and so it, um, you know, they realized that it was there and it was significant, but there was, I think the, the bigger appreciation was the, 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 the campus itself, the people that moved through the campus. Um, you know, I hear a lot of people talk about um, having, and you know, both blacks and whites in Mississippi uh, would talk about, well, I saw my first Joan Baez concert in, at Tougaloo, or um, I went to go hear Allen Ginsberg um, speak at Tougaloo, and, um, or uh, we had a professor who was a, uh, a huge fan of, um, of ancient music, and so he was one of our sociology professors, not John Salter, but his name was Ernest Berensky, who came um, to Tougaloo um, right after, um, well, he escaped Nazi Germany, and so he was a German Jew who came, and he um, loved ancient music and would host concerts in the chapel. And so many people came, and still to this day, they come to the campus to, to listen to ancient music in our chapel because we have a great um, organ, um, pipe organ that's on the, on the campus, and and so it's so it's an appreciation like that, and certainly the history, the civil rights history, is um, is important. But my goal is to allow people to know more about this collection, and so I want to get it out and and really um, and really do that. That's 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 my objective in life. It's my duty, really. <laughs> That would help. That would help for sure. Um, well, that is our time tonight. If anybody has any questions for Turi, I encourage you to come up afterwards. And if you haven't taken time to see the galleries, please um, stop in because it is an amazing collection with a really, like I said, fascinating story. And thank you for sharing some of it with us tonight, Turi. Oh, thank you for having me.